Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Bible study. Good to be with you tonight on another beautiful, beautiful day here in Darmstadt, Indiana. Beautiful fall weather. Just fantastic weather today. Was talking with my daughter in um, San Jose, and they had 97 degrees there today. And I, I was saying... Uh, it was just a beautiful fall day here. Uh, when we visited out there last year in October, uh, one of the tour guides said October is like their summertime out there. So um, I'm enjoying the fall weather myself. I'm glad uh, for fall. So good to see you all tonight. I saw already some comments. Um, Butch and Kitty. Earlier, Mike and Charlotte are with us and Kayla. And Mike and Charlotte, I met with them the other day. They're uh, planning on joining the church at the end of the month. We'll be having membership Sunday, October 25th. So good to see you all tonight. Looking forward to tonight's study on Philippians chapter 3. There's Donna. Couldn't have Donna Gross with us. Philippians chapter 3. Been really enjoying this particular book and this particular chapter. Looking forward to getting into it tonight. Philippians chapter uh, 3. Uh, some familiar portions to this um, book, but also I think some things that will be new. It's good to see Fred and Becky. And Donna and John are watching. Um, I do begin tonight with some sad news. Uh, Alan Fessmeyer passed away this morning. Good to have Robin and Elaine. Uh, Alan had been sick. Most people remember around the 16th, he went into um, the hospital to have surgery and um, for his bladder and uh, they thought perhaps it was cancer at that point. It wasn't. Uh, but when he went home, um, Sharon mentioned that he was starting to really decline. And uh, just the natural process of the things that he was dealing with, this Parkinson's and PSP. And and Sharon has shared this on a, a publicly on Facebook. And she said it's all right to share with people um, that Alan passed away. And I knew Alan for a long time. Um, when I was a, a part of the chaplaincy training program, uh, he was one of the people I got to kind of oversee. I was his supervisor for a while. Later on, he would become a chaplain at the Good Samaritan Home. And um, But I had, I had an opportunity to be his, what they call a CPE or clinical pastoral education supervisor for 10 weeks, where you get to know the person very closely, and we've always had a very good relationship. In fact, uh, tonight I'm going to be using one of the books Alan's been given me. So um, I know they're making arrangements with um, Alexander Funeral Home, and that will be coming out, and there will be a service and visitation. Talking, uh, I got to visit with Alan just yesterday at, at their home, and I uh, you know, it was obvious he knew I was there, and we prayed, read the Bible, and uh, Sharon said he smiled a lot, and that one of the things that he he often did, we often, when we would see each other, we would smile. We kind of had a similar sense of humor, Alan and I, and um, so I, I do want to be praying for Alan, but I was going to say uh, Alan's family. Hi, Marlon, is that uh, Sharon mentioned this morning, his wife, that when he passed this morning, it was very, very peaceful, very peaceful. So we praise God for that. He was only on hospice care for less than a couple of days. And um, and they mainly had done that because it was getting harder for Sharon to take care of him. So it, it real, once uh, the process of his dying happened, it happened rather quickly. And again, I'm speaking about Alan Fessmeyer, someone we've been praying for. Alan and Sharon were very involved when they could be before he got sick in our Wednesday Bible studies, which this is kind of the, the Wednesday Bible study in, in COVID mode. 
This is how we did the Wednesday Bible study. We went through things pretty in depth. We would work through a book, and Alan was very involved in that, uh, as was Sharon when when they were able to come. And so, definitely want to be praying for them for sure. Um, well, why don't we begin with a prayer? And I want to especially just pray for Sharon and for her family. Heavenly Father, we thank you this night for our opportunity to turn to your word. And as I'm thinking of Alan right now, I think of how much he really uh, enjoy those Bible studies and the in-depth nature of those studies. And then when we had a, a pastor group that would meet here at the church some, many of them retired pastors, Alan was a part of that. And uh, I thank you for those times that we had together and for the long uh, history that I've had with him and with Sharon both, as she was the the secretary there at the chaplain's office when I began. And um, I do pray for them. I pray that uh, that Sharon would experience right now your grace. I know she has been. I know she's experienced your grace as it's been working in their lives, especially in the last several days. And I pray that as She's facing this reality now, and as they're making the plans with her family in the funeral home, that she would experience your grace in the midst of all of this. And we pray that uh, the visitation and the service would uh, lift up the faith that Alan had and the, the hope and the comfort that we'll even talk about tonight, the true reality that has come in Christ. And uh, thank you again, Lord, for Alan's life. Thank you for this chance, even in the midst of this pandemic and all that's going on, that we can continue on this study of your word and find in that study um, the life, the health, the peace, the joy that you have for us and uh, the direction and the guidance that you will have for our lives. We receive your looking after us and guiding us this night through your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so again, if you're just joining us, I was sharing that um, one of our members, Alan Fessmeyer, passed away. Uh, his wife, Sharon, if you're friends with her on Facebook, and, it, and she shared it publicly, so if maybe you're not, but someone you're friends with is, it might have shown up because they commented. But she mentioned that Alan had passed away. And, um, and it was after, uh, after a long time of illness but just a real recent time of really a, a quick decline. And as I was saying, they believe it was primarily due to his, his chronic illnesses that he was dealing with just really began. Uh, Sharon was explaining to me how this PSP, which I don't fully understand what it is, but how it attacks uh, parts of the body and things and would be, be the cause of, of his, his decline and, and his passing away. Well, we're in Philippians chapter 3 tonight, and um, the sermon text is going to begin at the second half of verse 4 and continue on uh, to verse 14. But I want to start at the very beginning uh, and go, go over this, because the background to uh, verse 4 and on is found at the very beginning. And he says right at the very beginning, we're chapter 3, verse 1, Further, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Now, here we are again. Um, we've mentioned that rejoice and joy um, are a big part of this letter. Gordon Fee, a very a respected Bible expert, he said this is the sixth occurrence of the verb rejoice. Now, there's the noun joy, having a thing, joy, but this is the verb rejoice. And he is, in a sense, well, he is here, telling them to do something. If you remember, verb uh, speaks of an action that you do. And uh, for Paul, he says, this is a verb, something we do. The verb means to verbalize with praise and singing, echoing a refrain from the Psalter, from the Psalms. Psalm 32, 11 says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. 
sing all you who are upright in the heart. Remember, uh, Paul was a, a Jew. He was someone who was steeped in the Bible. And so it makes sense that uh, his commands to the Philippians would reflect his, his background in the, in the Bible. Psalm 35, 9 says, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. And Paul is picking up on these Old Testament themes that are really now finding their fulfillment, uh, our ultimate reason to rejoice in the Lord, which the Psalms, the Old Testament call us to do, we've come to have an even deeper reason, of course, because the Lord we're speaking of here is the Lord who's come in the flesh, um, Jesus Christ. But I want to get back to this idea that even in the Psalms, even in Psalm 32, when it says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous, it says, Sing, all you upright in heart. And uh, this Gordon Fee says that to rejoice in the verbal, good to have you with us, with us Betty, uh, Betty Kriedemeyer, that the verb rejoice is here talking about something we do, praise and singing. And you think of, even if it doesn't use rejoice in a lot of the Psalms, it will say, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Um, there's this consistent theme in the Bible that we're to take action in praising God and singing to God. Uh, rejoicing in the Lord. Now, again, the interesting background to this is the story of Paul's being in Philippi, the people he's writing to, uh, as it's told in Acts 16. Because we mentioned that in Acts 16, it says that they were thrown in jail because people, uh, a crowd was stirred up by these people who had had this woman who was telling the future, uh, Paul took away that ability as he, he commanded the spirit to come out of that woman. And so they stirred up the people to say, these people are undermining Roman values. And Paul got thrown in jail after a good caning. Uh, I think there's still some places in the Far East that cane. I'm not sure exactly where, but I know there, that that's happened. And that's something they did then, beat him, beat him with rods. But it says that while he was in jail, they sang hymns to God. And so it's interesting here. Paul did not just uh, say, you know, do as I say, not as I do. But he was a living example for rejoicing in the Lord. Here he was in jail, and he took this uh, action, the verbal action, of rejoicing in the Lord. Um, Paul thus gives this motif, meaning a theme, perspective. We are to rejoice in the Lord, as with the psalmists. The Lord who saves is the basis and the focus of our rejoicing. The phrase, in the Lord, re refers to the sphere of our present existence. We live in the Lord and thus points to our basic relationship to Christ. Christ is the center of it all. And as we're going to see, he's going to be contrasting Christ with his old way of life as a, a follower of Torah, of the Jewish law, which he'll jump into right away here. He says, it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. That's for the rest of verse 1. Well, one of the things he said, if you look, drop down in chapter 3 to verse 18, he says, as I have told, often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. What is he writing to them about again? He's, we're going to see in just a moment. He's writing to them again about people who are not letting what happened in Christ 
namely his death and his fulfilling of the Old Testament. Because remember, everything in the Old Testament, Paul says, is a shadow pointing to the substance, which is Christ. And so the Old Testament sacrifices, these were things that were to prepare and to point to Christ. And for Paul, when someone is not now living with that orientation as that is the fulfillment of all, of all these things, then they're, they're working against it. They are the enemies of it. And um, where he's really finding this is in what sometimes people have called the Judaizers. And these are people who wanted the Gentiles, Gentile meaning people who weren't raised Jewish, people like us, people who were not of the tribes of Israel, that in order for them to be a part of the people of God, even as Christians, they were to adopt the Jewish lifestyle. And Paul's going to say that to force that on people, that that's not their culture, is to lift this culture up to a place that it doesn't belong. Because if they've got Christ, they've got everything that culture was meant to point to. One of the interesting things is Paul doesn't say that if that's been your culture and you've always done that, that you don't you have to stop doing that. You know, it's traditions are a wonderful thing. And he wasn't against if you're a Jew and you want to keep doing your Jewish things, even though they're fulfilled in Christ, you can still do them thinking about them as that which has been fulfilled in Christ. But to make it a rule that all people have to adopt Jewish culture is not to live with that sense that what Jesus did has changed the world. And I've been thinking about that a lot, and you might have noticed in sermons and whatnot, what it, the world B.C., before Christ, and the world A.D., that things have changed. And to live as a Christian is to recognize that the, the world has changed, and my world has changed because of Christ. Well, let's look at the next verse, verse 2. We're going to see how serious and how uh, strong he is in his feelings on this with this first phrase. Watch out for those dogs. Wow. Now, uh, he's not talking there about, you know, we, we really love our dog, Otto, right? I mean, and if you've had pets, uh, you've become attached to your pets and you love them. In, in that world, dogs were not loved in the way they're loved today. You know, they're, they're not, they didn't have the same feeling about their animals as they do today. Some people say the, the Disney uh, got us to, to think of animals as human in a way. I don't know if that's true. I'm, I'm sure there's been a long time that, that people have had an attachment to their dogs. But uh, I, I, probably a lot of Disney movies have helped strengthen that bond with animals. But when my study of this, they all said, you know, you know, there was that proverb in the Bible, the dog returns to its vomit. And they, they thought, you know, something that goes back and eats its vomit. And I have to say, I've seen our own dog do that. That that for them was a sign of being pretty low. <laughs> you know, if you would do that kind of a thing, uh, that doesn't speak very highly of you as a, a, as a creature. And that's how they thought of dogs. And the Jewish people often spoke of um, Gentiles as dogs. There's even the very controversial story of Jesus. I believe it was the Syrophoenician woman from the Syria area of Syria and Phoenicia who comes to him and he says, remember Jesus says, and he I, I, the way I interpret this, this is one of the most controversial sayings of Jesus, the controversial scenes, is I, I think of him as assuming in his relationship with her for, for the sake of drawing her faith out. And th this is a really good point, that, that it seems like God will oftentimes, to be tested doesn't necessarily always mean a bad thing. A test can also make you stronger, right? When a person is lifting weights, it tests their muscles. 
it's a it's a something that pushes against their muscles and it, it's and it and it's hard but it makes their muscles stronger and if there wasn't that test it wouldn't draw out the strength in those muscles Jesus being tested in the wilderness. We discovered this last night in our confirmation class that we're doing online. We're, uh, we're, we're in the baptism and temptation of Jesus. This year we're doing the New Testament. And part of his going into the wilderness at the very beginning to be tested, it, he's going as a, as a man who's also God, but he's acting in the strength of a man, one way to look at that is in this testing, it's, it's strengthening him for the journey ahead to have to push against the temptations of the devil. Um, on the other side of that, it makes him stronger. Well, I, I see Jesus saying, assuming the, the um, mindset of the typical Jew, Jew when he says to that Syrophoenician woman, it's not proper to give uh, the, the children's food to the dogs. And he was saying something in that moment that reflects uh, the way Jews would have spoken to them. And uh, her faith is such, she says, yes, but even the dogs get the scraps off the table and her faith presses through. She doesn't, she sees who Jesus is and she clings to that. She sees that he is this man of, of genuine love. But that's one of the most difficult passages. But it, one thing about that passage of Jesus, it's very authentic to the time. And what's funny here is Paul is now taking the word that Jews would use for Gentiles, and he's using it on the Jews. These are the true dogs. These, these particular Judaizers who are trying to make Gentiles have to live like, like Jews. He's calling them the, the ones who are the dogs. So he's reversing it. And then look at even stronger. Those evildoers. Now, Wow, what, what are they doing that he's calling them evildoers? Well, then the next phrase, those mutilators of the flesh. Those people who force people to be circumcised. Well, that is really strong language because Paul is someone who was himself circumcised. He's going to say that in just a minute, that on the eighth day when the boy was supposed to be circumcised, he was circumcised by his faithful Jewish parents and yet he's calling that now evil doing. He's doing this on purpose to really say, if you undermine the truth about Jesus, you're an evil doer. If you undermine people's knowledge of what has what ha what he's accomplished, and uh, this is a, a a stern warning for us that we should not obscure the truth about Jesus the truth of God's word. That's just like at the end of the book of Revelation, it says the one who adds or takes away from the prophecy of this book, to them will come all the plagues that have been described in the book of Revelation. The idea is, is it's don't you distort what God would have people to understand. And so he wants to make it clear to these Philippians that this isn't a harmless thing. It might seem harmless to some people. Well, they just want you to be circumcised. But because it's distorting people putting their faith in Christ and resting on what he's accomplished, uh, for him it's evil doing. And he calls it mutilating of the flesh. Verse 3, for it is we, meaning we Christians, who are the circumcision. We Christians are the circumcision. Now, in um, the book of Colossians, it's where he talks about that the true circumcision is a circumcision of the heart, and, uh, and that that is what has happened to us in Christ, that we are uh, the true circumcision. Let me see if I can find that. I had that text here, but I can just pull it up quick. Um, and... In this particular um, circumcision of the heart, it relates it in Philippians or Colossians. Let me find that there. To, um, to baptism. 
And so in that text that, um, that I have from Alan Fessmeyer, many of the early um, church reformers would speak about that, that this connection to those who have received being connected to Jesus, and that way we do that is through accepting being baptized, that uh, we are the truly circumcised. But yeah, this is Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, And you have been made complete in Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You are complete in him. That's another thing he's saying to the Colossians. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off, and the NIV, it says, of your sinful nature or of your flesh. With the circumcision performed by Christ and not by human hands, and having been buried with him in baptism, you were raised with him through your faith in the power of God. So that he's connecting that receiving of being connected, that they wanted to be connected to Jesus by receiving being baptized in his name, that they have received the true circumcision, which again, um, they would have known very graphically that circumcision removes flesh and that the imagery is as the heart has become covered over and is insensitive. And when Christ comes into your life, he removes that insensitivity to God and he opens up a, a fellowship with God that wasn't there before. And that's what he says that reality is the real thing. That's what you want. Uh, the change of a physical removal of flesh, that's not the same, and it's not of the same value uh, as having a changed heart. The changed heart is the real thing. The circumcision of the flesh, that was a, a picture of that. Don't hold on to the picture when you can have the real thing. And I've, I've probably said this before, uh, the way I often think about that are how the things in the Bible are the symbols and the real thing is what's come in Christ and we're to cling to the real thing is how when I was a child, we had got the Sears Christmas catalog, the wish book, and we would look through it and we of, often saw things in there that we wanted. And I remember at one time wanting a particular thing and I cut it out and I hung it on a a bulletin board or a cork board I had in my bedroom. And one day, eventually, I got the real thing. And uh, it would have been foolish of me to, to ignore the real thing and hold on to that piece of paper. And that's the same thing in Paul's mind. The things in the Old Testament are like the pieces of paper or the pictures of the toys in the Sears catalog wish book or for people today, the, the pictures on an Amazon website and to, and to make that everything. And that's to really to miss the big point. The big point is that you, you've got the real thing now. The real thing is a changed heart, true circumcision. He says, we who serve God by his spirit, we're the ones circumcised. We have this spiritual reality. We boast in Christ Jesus, he said. And we put no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in our having done certain actions as a way of earning God's favor. Though, he says, I myself have reasons for such confidence. Now, here's another interesting thing here that's going on. If you remember back in chapter 2, uh, he said they should have the same mind as Christ Jesus. That's the chapter just before this. And there were things Christ could have, in an essence, boasted of. He was in the very nature God. And he could have been, he could have seen himself as being, uh, and he did see himself as equal to God. But he didn't make that something that he would grasp and hold on to. Wow, good to have my sister with us from Wisconsin, Charlene, joining us. And uh, the pattern of Jesus there, of course, is that he doesn't hold on to the things he could boast in. And just then afterwards, he talks about 
Timothy and Epaphroditus there in the end of chapter 2 as examples of people who didn't hold on to the things they could boast in. And here, chapter 3, he's talking about that same issue again. He's saying uh, these people are boasting in themselves. They're not following the pattern of Christ. And the, the pattern of Christ is to turn away from yourself, even in the way of our salvation, and to turn to uh, and to humble ourselves. Remember, James says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But here's what he says. I, I had myself had some reasons. I have some reasons for confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day. That is in Jewish law, when a baby was born, a boy, on the eighth day they were to be circumcised. He was. What we know is, is that there were some people in that time period who were influenced by uh, Greek philosophy who stopped circumcising their children. And so there were Jews who, who thought of it as, well, we don't do that anymore, and those who do. And Paul says, my family was of the strict family that did that. We believed in it. He says, of the people of Israel, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I was born an Israelite, of the tribe of Benjamin, if you remember, of the 12 tribes, there were two sons from the same mother, Joseph and Benjamin. Remember when Joseph is in Egypt, you know, they leave Benjamin back, the brothers who had sold him into um, slavery, because they just thought if, if we don't, if we lose this one brother, the other brother that's loved, um, you know, as, this, as the son of Rebekah, the, the one that... Um, um, that my dad really loved, Isaac and Rebekah. Remember, because he married Leah, and then he had the two slave women. So he had, he, had, he had children from four women, but the one he really loved was this one woman, Rebekah. And he thought he had lost Joseph. And Benjamin was this other favored child. And so that might be what, what uh, Paul's talking about here. Even when Benjamin goes into the, the land of Israel, they get an extra portion of land, including Jerusalem, this key place. And so not only is he an Israelite, and not only was he circumcised on the eighth day, but he's from one of the favored children of um, the man whose name was changed to Israel, uh, Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Some say that that might mean that among the Hebrews, he was one of the few who really knew and spoke Hebrew. That is, in those days, they often used Greek and Aramaic as their main languages, but he had studied to be a rabbi and everything. So not only was he of all these things, he was someone who, who spoke Hebrew. In regard to the law of Pharisee, the Pharisees, of course, were meticulous about following the law. As for zeal, persecuting the church. And as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So he said, if, I have, if anyone has anything to boast in, in myself, in my achievements, in my heritage, in where I come from, if anyone should be looking at themselves and thinking, look at me, how great I am, that's me. But what does he say? Verse 7, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. That is, this is the key thing for him, and that's where it began. That's why I wanted to start in verse 1. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Where is one to find their, their, their identity, their purpose, their peace, their life? For him, it's in, in this, this reality of the Lord, Christ, who comes and is the fulfillment of all those things that used to be so important to him. And he now sees, like I saw as a child, that the picture in the Sears catalog, that's nothing compared to the real thing. And I would rather throw that away to have the real thing. And that's what he's saying here. The real thing has appeared. The substance has appeared in this world. And the substance is the man, Christ. Uh, thinking about Alan Fessmeyer, uh, we just mentioned that he had passed away. Uh, one of the things he and I shared in common is we both had a uh, we both had a, an appreciation for uh, an American Christian philosopher, theologian, 
who had come from Germany during World War II, was actually uh, kicked out of teaching by Hitler. And he's buried in New Harmony. His name was Paul Tillich. And uh, he's not, he wasn't the p- most perfect guy, Paul Tillich, but he had a lot of um, interesting ideas. But what he said was this man who was very, very intellectual, smart man, he taught at Harvard and uh, was a university professor, meaning he could teach any subject he wanted. Uh, he was considered of that caliber of scholarship. But something Tillich always said is that he was someone who had been grasped, and that was the phrase or the word he would always use, grasped by Christ. And that that being grasped by him is what made him a Christian. That's what caused him to spend his life thinking about what does this all mean, is that the reality of what he called the new being, which is this life that was lived in Christ, had gotten a hold of him. And that's Paul here. He says, what is more, verse 8, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Here's someone who's been grasped by that reality, and he sees how beautiful and how marvelous it is, and he wants to see that all the more. Jesus said when a person really sees this reality, and one of the phrases he uses for the reality that's appearing in him is this rule of God, the appearance of God ruling in someone's life, in Jesus' life. And Jesus himself said when someone sees that, they recognize that this is a treasure worth selling all you have to obtain. You know, he talked about the treasure hidden in a field. And a person sells everything they have because they see how uh, precious that treasure is. And and Jesus said, when someone recognizes the place of God's rule and they really see it, that's how they'll act. They'll they'll want to get rid of everything. They'll want to. They don't want anything to keep them from experiencing that reality because it's just that great. They recognize it. And then he talks about a pearl of great price. The same thing. And it's all about. If you really see what's appearing in me, if you really see how beautiful this is, how beautiful I am, well, then everything else will become uh, nothing, you know. Uh, We even have songs about that, you know. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, then the things of earth will go strangely dim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. All these things come and go, they're so transitory. But in the person of Jesus, we find that which is of lasting worth, that which um, never never fades, never gets old, and only gets more and more profound the more you peer into it. I have to say that for myself. The more I study, the longer I've been a pastor, it's not, it never becomes old. It's not like chewing gum. You know, that the more you chew on it, well, eventually you get to the end of the flavor. The more you study the Bible and the more you 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 learn it about it in its many layers, the reality of who Christ is never never runs dry. In fact, I'd say if it's running dry, well then you're really you're really not you're really staying at a at a surface level. Perhaps you need to be pushing on deeper. Well, here's what he says here. He says, um, for whose sake I have lost all things. Now, remember, he was someone who was an up-and-coming star in Judaism. And um, now he's considered an outcast and a pariah by all the leaders of Israel. So everything that he could have boasted in, he really did lose. And as he's writing this letter, remember, he was arrested in in Jerusalem by his own people because someone said, well, I saw him take a Gentile into into the temple, which he didn't do. But basically, he was rejected by the leadership of Jerusalem, and they've sent him now to to Rome to be judged and to be put to death. That's their goal. So he's lost everything. Here is a man who's lost everything. But listen to what he says. He says, of the things that he lost, he says, I consider them garbage. 
you see he's using strong language here to really try to accentuate just how beautiful Christ is, that the things that he used to think were so important in life, this seems like garbage. This seems um, just so empty, so uh, vacuous, so shallow. And I think of the things in our world that sometimes tempt us, especially when we're younger, we're tempted by money and uh, fame, um, pleasure, beauty, uh, stuff. And again, from a Christian perspective, all these things are gifts from God, and yet they're nothing in comparison to God himself because he is the source of those things, and he is the ultimate of all those things. And you realize that these things are just uh, derivatives, and they pale in comparison to the, the beauty that is Christ. And so for him, he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. That is, I don't want any of these things to distract me from what really is so, I've come to recognize and know as so precious. And I, do you see what he's saying? Is he's saying, I've come to experience this, and that's what's motivating me. And there's something I find as a pastor is it's very hard to just tell people, do this. Do this hard life change. Make this hard decision to go the hard way, to go the hard way of denying these parts of your life, denying these things you want to do. You can't beat someone over the head and get them to deny themselves. It's not going to motivate them. That's and they're going to do, not be doing it with the right spirit. They're going to just be doing it because, oh, i got to do this because the pastor would be judging me if I don't give up doing this thing I want to do. And that, that doesn't get anywhere. The better thing would be to, to try to help them to see how that thing that they're doing is keeping them from really experiencing and knowing the better thing and to let go of that thing that they might experience that which is so much more profound and lasting. It's very hard when people are young to get them to think that way. Uh, it's fascinating as I deal with people all different ages. A lot of people who are up in age, who've lived a little while, they have the gift of perspective, right? <laughs> Some distance. And they see that a lot of these other things that we're tempted by when we're younger are so fleeting and so empty and don't last. And, and, um, they have more more um, willingness to think about these deeper things. And that helps a lot. But Paul's saying that. He's saying, I want to gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him. To be found in him. To be a Christian is to be in Christ. It's to live your life in the sphere of Christ, in, in him. He is that in which you live. That's why it often spoke in the book of Acts of people being baptized in Jesus' name and into Christ, into his life. It's He's the one we identify with and we live from, and he's our connection to God. And he goes on to explain that not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. What he's saying there, not having a rightness to my life that comes from my having done the things I'm supposed to do. That I went, th I jumped through the hoops, I was circumcised, I uh, observed the Sabbath, I uh, did the letter of the law. No, he doesn't want that. He wants this which comes from God. Uh, and I really like how it is, um, this verse is in the Common English Bible, a newer translation, which translates it, I think, in the way that I think scholars are coming to see is the better way of translating it. Um, it says, To be found in him, in Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. 
the faithfulness of Christ. In some of my studies, I've brought this up before, that there's, there's always been a question of how do you translate what's called the genitive form of the word pistis or faith? Do you translate it as something we're doing, we're having faith in Christ? Or pistis can also mean faithfulness. Is this describing the faithfulness of Christ? So you see there's my faith that's towards Christ or the faith of Christ. And uh, the way this reads, I think it makes the most sense because then right after it, he says, it is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. Our faith is mentioned after, but it doesn't, uh, I think he's first emphasizing the faithfulness of Christ. Remember I said, the things that of God operate and are given to us in accordance with our human nature. God's the one who gave us our human nature. They don't operate. Hope is faith looking forward, yes. We'll get to that in, in just a moment, Marlon. But remember, I've mentioned that faith is not something that just happens contrary to our nature, that God just gives us faith as something as a sheer act of power where he he overrides our humanity. No. Faith arises because we, even in the just the realm of everyday life, because we find someone faithful. We trust someone because they've shown themselves trustworthy. And more and more, I think, scholars are recognizing in these places where faith is being used twice like this, that the first thing being emphasized is the faithfulness of Christ. And so the common English Bible says, In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness. Yes, uh, that is true, Kimberly. Faith is sometimes, and it's good to have you with us, Kim Wilner. Um, it is hard. And I say that the way that we grow in faith is by observing the faithfulness of the other person. That is, you, you come over time as you're around another person to recognize in them, here is someone I can trust. They're trustworthy. And that's why I think the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word about Christ. It's the more we can get ourselves around the picture of Christ and the person of Christ and the character of Christ that's captured in the Bible. That's why we have four Gospels. That's why really all the stories really are pointing to him. And as we see that they're all reflecting him, we see the glory of God in the face of Christ. It inspires us to trust because we see that this God in this man, Jesus, the character of Jesus, the person of Jesus, inspires trust. I trust this man. So that idea that, like I was saying, I even said this to Alan yesterday when I was at his house and got to pray with him before he died. I reminded him about our shared appreciation of this man, Tillich, who talked about his, he just was always grasped by Christ. And I was telling, you know, reminding Alan of that, of our being gripped by the person of Jesus. That's, that's where our faith comes from. It's, it's the more we can get around hearing the story about him and um, beholding him. So that's Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word about Christ. So that brings us to the next thing he's going to say here. Verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. That is, and everyone I study on this is saying, he's not talking so much about his future resurrection as a man. He, that comes up in this passage. But here he's talking about the fact that Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. And he can be experienced as a living reality because he's been raised. And that when you're meditating on the message about Christ, and you're being inspired to faith in him by ab absorbing that message. See, that's where we began in the passage, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord, you're singing songs about him, you're reminding yourself about who Jesus is. You're, you're, you're... So 
singing songs. Um, I don't think I'm sharing anything personal here. Uh, one of the things that Sharon uh, Allen's wife was saying is that in those last days, one of the things she would do is sing songs uh, in, the, in the room where he was laying in bed, uh, songs of praise. And that, that those songs of praise, as you're singing songs of praise about Jesus, inspires your faith, and it does bring him into your life. This He's not dead. He's a living reality. He's been raised from the dead. And that's earlier he talked about the Spirit. The Spirit is the personal presence of God who comes through Jesus as you're praising him and you're talking about him and lifting him up. And again, I would say in these crazy days, both uh, with the pandemic, but also with the politics, we got two Ps there, pandemic, politics, that if you're meditating all day on, on the news and you're watching 24-hour uh, cable, which I watch a lot of news, I got to say, and I read several newspapers every day, and I can find in my own person that I can become agitated and not at peace. And uh, when I get up and I go down in the gym oftentimes here and I'll walk around and I'll read my devotional material and I will, I will sing songs and I will turn my heart to Christ, I experience the presence of Christ in my life. And that's what Paul wants. I want to know him, the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, as I studied this, many pointed out that this both refers to his own, what, what our baptism signifies, our dying to our old ways of life. And everything Paul said about here earlier was, I'm putting aside all the other things in life that are keeping me from him. And that's what I'm saying is, as a pastor, you, you, it's, you're tempted to try to say, now you just be, do the right thing. You just be, you know, do live the Christian life because that's what you're supposed to do. And you feel, uh, you know, as a pastor, sometimes an obligation, you know, your job is to, to set the standard, to say, toe the line. But uh, deep down, you know that that's not what's going to make people. And it's, it's not the best, that's not the way anyway. The way is, is you want to inspire people to, to say, I don't want anything in my life that keeps me from, from really experiencing and knowing Christ. And so because I find him to be the treasure, because I find him to be the pearl, I'm going to give up everything that I might know him. And that's part of what Paul's talking about here when he's talking about participating in his dying because Jesus surrenders himself to his father. I want to be like him in his death, so surrendered to God. And then it says, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, that so somehow is, a, is a, an, an idiom, a way of speaking to try to speak humbly, to, to say, you know, I, he's not saying that, no, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. He believes it's going to happen. He's saying somehow I get to be included. And I know I get to be included, but I just, somehow it's true, but I don't, he's trying to say, I don't deserve it but I get to participate in this life everlasting. So it's a, it's a way of speaking humbly. Not that I've already obtained all this. I'm not arrived. And this is a great reminder for Christians. None of us arrives in this life. Or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And that is that, that new reality in Christ. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ. He's called me heavenward, that is, to a heavenly life. You know, the kingdom of heaven is a, a bit of heaven right here on earth of experiencing the, the life of God right now that is in Christ. And he's saying, I haven't, I don't live there all the time. I'm not, I haven't arrived. I'm growing. This is a good word for all of us that uh, to realize, you know, just because we uh, aren't there, we shouldn't be down on ourselves. 
Here the Apostle Paul can say that. And so we all have to say, I'm not there yet, but I, I'm pushing. But what is he doing? He's putting everything aside that he could run uh, with with uh, boldness. I got a, um, a picture here that I got from one of my resources. Uh, a favorite image in the ancient world was of this race. And you see how they're, they're running there and they have nothing on. That's one of the things that they would do. Now, why would they do that? Because they were wanting to win the race and, and you didn't want to have anything holding you back. So you got rid of everything, literally your clothes. And um, they would be putting their eye on the prize and they would be fixed on that. Uh, the competitors, though, through severe training, had no super, superfluous flesh and ran unclothed. Flesh and clothing were laid aside as a weight that might hinder them in the race. Yeah. So uh, you talk about dedication. They uh, were willing to, to strip down to nothing. That is, they carried nothing with them. And so Paul is, is you know... It's not that we can't have good things in this life, but we should have them as if we don't have them. They should really not have us. There was a, there's a good book, The Freedom of Simplicity by Richard Foster. He wrote, and I know Kayla Street really, she knows uh, Richard Foster's work. He wrote The Celebration of Discipline, and, and Kayla actually gave me a book of, of various spiritual writers that I've appreciated over, who wrote over the centuries. But in the freedom of simplicity, he talks about that, that, um, that we're called to not be attached to things because as soon as you become attached to them, they're, they're, they're holding you back, just like clothing would have held those, those runners back. And Paul's image here is forgetting what is behind. I'm wanting the heavenly life of knowing Christ and anything that's keeping me from knowing him I want to I want that in my life. I want that in my life. Well, that's where our text ends for Sunday. It ends right there. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I guess what I would say to you is those who have been listening tonight is that that this is what God would want for you. Yes, we can have them, but they don't have us, that is. Yes, very good, Kim. Very good. Yeah, that's the whole thing, that, that things are not to have you and, um, and to cultivate. And the way I would say it again is the best way for things not to have you is to really cultivate the knowledge of Christ. And the more you cultivate the knowledge of Christ and the more you cultivate knowing him, the more other things will really seem, um, they won't seem that, that special compared to that, compared to that fullness that one has in him as one is spending time getting to know him. And that's why Paul says, I want to know him. And, and it's kind of one of those circles, you know, the more you want to know him, the more you let go of things. And the more you let go of things, the more you know him. And the more you know him, the more you let go of things. And the more... He becomes your all-consuming reality, and you want to be like him. And so you want to be like him, and so you start to act like him. And you start to be like him, and it's coming from this place of not being told you got to be like him. It's because that's what you value, that's what you desire, that's what you want. And it's, and it's driving you, and it's faith arising out of uh, experiencing his faithfulness towards you. Well, let's end with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for the beauty that is Christ. And forgive us for the fact that we don't, we don't pursue him like we should. That, uh, that we don't, uh, like Paul, make it our desire to know him with such intensity. May we, may we want that more and more. And as we do it more and more, it would make us want it more and more because we'll see how beautiful he is. And our lives will be more and more shaped and determined by our faith and how what the things we value. That's the main thing. Paul was saying these people, their lives are not the things they're valuing, circumcision, 
Jewish laws. They don't realize that that's not the stuff. The stuff is Jesus. And may we see that, Lord, that that's the thing of value. And that as we experience that and know that, uh, may our lives then experience this power of his presence through the resurrection in our lives, that he is a living reality, not a, a dead idea, a mere something in the head, but a, an experienced person that we know personally, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we can say, I know him and I want to know him more because he lives in me. He lives within my heart. We pray it and receive it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, once more, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.